Hi, I'm Joe Folkman, and welcome to the webinar. Jack, good to see you. Thank you. It's nice to, to have to see you as well. Uh, it's our pleasure to welcome you here. And uh, so in addition to Joe and myself, that will be your um, presenters today, we have Tracy Consolini, who is our, one of our regional vice presidents, who will be our chat host. So if you have any questions that come up that you would like answers to, uh, please type them in the chat box and Tracy will be the one who will be responding to you. At the end of our uh, webinar today, uh, Brianne O'Corin, the director of marketing and, and the co-host of our podcast, The 90th Percentile, she will be making a special uh, offer to you uh, that will be part of this uh, this whole webinar process. So, um, Joe? Well, uh, one thing I wanted to mention is we do have a self-assessment that's connected with you. Many of you have done this already, uh, so thank you so much. Uh, but if you haven't done it, you can uh, do the self-assessment. It takes about five minutes, so it's very short. Uh, you can type into your computer bit.ly slash champion change assessment, and it has to be in lowercase, but you can do that self-assessment. And uh, if, if you don't want to do it now, you'll, you can do it after the webinar is over, but it'll give you an interesting assessment of your uh, preference for uh, champion change. So we'll begin by talking about our objectives for the session today. Uh, first, we're going to be working to expand our thinking about the process of leading change. The second thing we'll be doing is to help leaders improve the process that they've elected to use to go about this change process. Uh, we'll share with you some data that we've collected recently uh, that we think will be insightful to you and help you understand what's happening right up to the moment. And finally, we'll talk about how we maybe apply the, the theory that we're going to talk to you about to a common change challenge. We, we believe that most of us in the learning and development arena, those of us who are concerned about leadership development, we probably all face a fairly common problem. So we're gonna to toss that problem out to you and then apply our theory to that. So off we go. Um, we, we invite you to kind of reflect back to February of 2020, uh, when we really began to experience the onset of the COVID pandemic. And so our, our question to you is, how much change did your organization go through uh, as the in the aftermath uh, of the months that followed that um, that event? Uh, and we're going to give you four choices: no change to speak of, little change, substantial change, and then number four, a huge change. So if you would, if you would uh, kind of weigh in on this question, uh, let's just see what uh, the consensus might be here in terms of little change, substantial change, huge change. Well, All God. right, so no big surprise. Uh, most organizations had substantial change and in many cases it was, it was huge. So thanks for that. Um, the next poll is asking you to kind of reflect back and sort of say, what grade would you give your organization for how well it handled those change efforts uh, during that period of time? How did your organization respond? So A, if, would you give, give the organization an A or a B grade? Go back to your school days of uh, the, the professor gives you a grade. What grade would you give your organization in terms of how they handled that level of change? 
Jack, what would you give us as a zinc <laughs> spokesman on that? What grade would you give us? You know, I I'd give us kind of a B minus. I think yeah. uh, we we um, we struggled with kind of the questions about you know we work you know work in the office or you know work from home and what's the right ratio and but I think we didn't make any draconian decisions that alienated a great majority of our people. So it's interesting. So uh, most of you on the call apparently give your organizations a, a similar grade. That you know we gave ourselves a B, and then we have a you know an F. <laughs> apparently, <laughs> someone gave their organization an F <laughs> and B. Uh, so you know, I guess the message is that we all recognize that when uh, a monumental change like this occurs. Um, it, it, it's it's a challenge and how well we respond maybe has a lot to do with our personal understanding of change and our understanding of the best ways to go about handling change. So Jack, it, it, it's an interesting thing. And we wanted to start off by talking about uh, some theories of change and 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 one of the theories that I really like a lot uh, you know came from a, a partner of mine Gene Dalton. Gene was a great friend and a partner. He was uh, one of my professors at uh, Brigham Young University uh, and by the way his daughter works for us today so <laughs> <laughs> we we have a lot of love for for uh, Dalton's and and Gene and and uh, but he he had this model of change and basically there were two conditions that necessary for change to start. The first is felt need, and again the classic story is the story of someone who is an alcoholic and uh, kind of uh, is married, but the you know the spouse you know, kind of mentions that they think this person has a problem and they go, like, oh, no, I don't, it's not a problem. And then uh, the boss mentions it and, and it, no, it's not a problem, but eventually the person loses their job, they're unemployed and destitute. They end up uh, divorced. And uh, one morning they're, they, they're lying in a gutter on the street and all of a sudden they wake up and say, I think I have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and that's that felt need, right? Yeah. And yeah. in the pandemic, you know, I, I remember at first there was a lot of denial, right? And I know we were doing a project with a company in France, Jack, and I I, I I was planning a trip back to, you know, to France in, in June, you know, it's like, I didn't see any problem with that, but that never happened, <laughs> you know, so there was, you know, but it took a while for, for just to kind of, it, do we really need to do this? The second thing is this idea of a respected source. And clearly, uh, you know, there was a lot of respected sources, government sources and and, uh, you know, we, that we relied on in, in this pandemic and they gave us advice. Uh, you know, it was interesting because that varied from one area to another. Now, the conditions necessary for successful change to occur, goals need to go from general to specific. And we saw a lot of that in the pandemic from, uh, you know, well, we kind of need to wear a mask to, well, we really need to wear a mask. Uh, social ties had a lot of uh, impact on that. And we saw that even in areas of the country where, you know, masks were very common in some areas of the country and not so common in others. Uh, one of the things that they found is that, that self-esteem need to move from low to high, you know, and if, if people, in the change process continued to have low self-esteem, they found that that would affect the change, but also the motive for change uh, needed to move from external. Okay, the government tells us we need to, to do these things to, you know, I believe, and, you know, this is the right thing to do. And so, you know, these things are, are common. 
Now, another model of change is the McKinsey 7S model. And the 7S is the top three are what we call the hard S's, strategy, structure, systems, right? And as you think about uh, what happened in the pandemic and some, some strategies had to completely change, other company strategies didn't. But uh, clearly ours did. We, uh, the majority of our training events were in-person events and they all had to move to online. That was a huge shift and and in how we did our work and 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 the process of doing it so structures changed who reported to who systems we all learned to to use uh you know zoom and and teams and and we all had to learn how to kind of uh be be okay with our having our picture up in front of us on the screen now the soft s's shared values skills style and staff uh, those are the bottom four. And, and again, we saw significant shifts there. These are both models that, as you think about bringing change into your organization, help you think about how you can introduce the change, how you can cement it down, what needs to change. It really is important. Jack, you, you've used all these models a lot and, and are familiar with them both, I, I know. Right. So uh, one of the things that we thought about was, well, what today really needs you to think about change and what's probably going on in your organization that require change? We are still struggling with where we work. <laughs> the, the big surprise that, that I had in the pandemic was I was absolutely sure that engagement would go down when I measured remote workers during the pandemic. And to my surprise, engagement went up. People loved working remotely. And that was a huge surprise for me. We also found that productivity was up, but now it's shifting back and forth and organizations are still struggling with this. And, and uh, you know, I wrote an article last week and, and found that in some uh, conditions and circumstances, remote workers were better off. And in some cases, uh, office workers were remote, uh, were better off and, and they were doing better. Uh, technologies, digitization is, is occurring and the cultural changes, uh, valuing diversity and, and work-life balance. Those are huge shifts. Engagement, uh, quiet quitting and the great resignment markets change and, and AI is coming along. So there's lots going on, Jack, all over uh, in terms of these changes. Uh, so there's more. <laughs> yeah. And this is, you know, that was our list. Uh, and we just thought we'd add uh, to that with uh, a synopsis of McKinsey's recent publication on 10 shifts, transforming organizations and they came up with a, in some cases, a similar list, and in some cases, quite a little different than ours. Uh, we're particularly struck by this number seven, uh, that, that they they recognize that one major shift is that leaders, leaders need to become more self-aware and particularly need to become more inspiring. And, and we have talked a lot about that. The concept that we'd like to have you think about with us is the fact that not all change is equal. Uh, the pandemic was a monumental change and, and impacted uh, everyone in, an orga in, in most organizations and, and everyone to some degree. Uh, but in reality, there are some changes that are, are fairly you know, kind of minor. Uh, it could be the way we introduce a new product or that we expand geographically or that we adopt a, you know, a, a general growth pattern. Uh, a second level of change is, you know, a more, a more complex one. Uh, and that may be that we have to change some of the internal work processes. We're going to adopt a new accounting software and, and our own firm is just about to go through that. And so, 
it doesn't require huge behavioral changes on the part of most people, but it does, you know, it disrupts things a little bit. The third level of change is the change that requires employees to, to act and, and behave differently. It, it, re, it requires them a, a, acquiring a new mindset. And so it truly modifies the organization a great deal. And we, as we think about these three levels of change, uh, we'd invite you to think about this, this list we were looking at before. Uh, are are these minor kind of not very not very significant not very intrusive or are they going to require mostly level three changes? We're not going to ask you to to vote on each one, but we would we would submit to you that our our thinking is that virtually all the ones that were on this list all the ones that were on McKinsey's list of, of 10 shifts that are occurring are ones that are going to require kind of that third level. These are fairly significant, fairly major uh, organizational changes. And therefore, we need to think hard about what is the, what is the process we need to use? What are the what are the ground rules of bringing about this kind of change? What are the skills that this is going to require of me as a leader in this in an organization uh, to to make this work successfully? So we submit to you that it's going to require level three kind of behavior. Now we can talk about what those specific behaviors are, and we're going to propose a few to you that our research shows to be important. We'd also like to kind of talk about what's the process that leaders should know and understand and that would help guide us through this whole process of, uh, of change. And then finally, we're gonna just kind of focus on what's required for someone to successfully lead this third level of, of change. So that's the, these are the questions that the rest of the webinar is going to address. Oh, thanks for that, Jack. Uh, well, so for this webinar, what we thought would be interesting would be just uh, focusing in on data we've collected since 2022 and into 2023. So we collected data on 2,392 leaders. And they were all assessed with 360 degree assessments. And so we're using that data just to sort of say, okay, in terms of champion change, in terms of uh, leveraging change, what's happening right now? And how is that viewed in the environment in 2022 and 2023 with the data that we've collected? Now, the first thing that we do is we're going to show you how people rate this champion change in importance. And as you look down through the list here, you see number one, inspires and motivates others, right? That that, that is viewed as very important. And number two is drive for results. So the push and the pull, integrity and honesty solves problems. And if you sort of asking the question, where is champions change? Well, it's number 13 <laughs> <laughs> in terms of importance. And, and what's, yeah, what's fascinating about this is that the, the idea of leading change has always been kind of the major uh, fulcrum point, the, the major hurdle that sort of separates being a, a manager and being a leader. Mm -hmm. So to the degree that we are talking about how leaders function, you would you would have thought maybe that they would see that championing change is more more important than than this graph would suggest that that puts it down, you know, in the bottom, you know, bottom, bottom third, third yeah. Yeah, of, yeah. Of, the, of the skills. Yeah, and, and I certainly did. And but but if you look at 
this data, the same data, the importance data by level, what you do see is that for top management, 37% <laughs> of the people, uh, you, you know, said that that was important for senior leaders, 31, for middle managers, 19, and then the supervisors, 8%. So what you start to see is that, well, okay, if you're a top manager, this is a critical skill. And and Jack, your point was, well, if you want to be a top manager, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you need to be able to demonstrate this. And, and yet, as we went through all of those issues that are happening across the organization, you have to imagine that every leader in an organization, in fact, even individual contributors, change is there and it's an important part of their you know they, they they need to know how to get change to occur and be effective at it now on the right side you see the effectiveness of the leaders and you can see that the top management scores at the 57th percentile senior management 48th middle management 46th and supervisors 46th so uh, as 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 we go down the organizational hierarchy, the effectiveness decreases. I'm fascinated by how close or how similar, though, those last uh, three groups uh, were to each other. That the yeah. senior, the middle, and the supervisors. Yeah. Not all, you know, not that far apart. In fact, not middle managers apart. and supervisors are basically. So, obviously, we think that, ch that leading change is is really important for people at all, at all levels of the hierarchy in the organization. Yeah, we do. And, 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 you know, as you look at the functions in the organization, what you see is general management comes in at the 56th percentile, marketing 55th, operations, legal. Uh, it's interesting, sales at the 50th. But if you look down at the bottom of that list, you can see that manufacturing and, and you know, in manufacturing, things are pretty stable. But yet, the, I mean, there's lots going on there. Quality management, uh, facilities, engineering. Yeah. So there, there's levels where some people are more effective on, on that than others and in functions. Yeah. yeah. It varies a lot. Now, if you think about the importance of champions change, if we just look at this one competency and look at the impact that it has on a leader's overall effectiveness, you can see that people that are really effective at champions change tend to be rated significantly higher as a leader. In fact, if you're in the top 10%, on champions change, your overall leadership effectiveness scores at the 91st percentile. So this is a competency that really separates the good from the great, doesn't it, Jack? It really does, yeah. Now, it also influences engagement. Uh, leaders who resist change, who are slow to change, uh, the engagement of their direct reports are at the 25th or 36th percentile versus those who embrace champion and change and, and really do well at it, their direct reports are at the 68th to the 76th percentile, the top quartile. Yeah. Yeah. And that makes a huge difference. We also looked at one particular uh, behavior uh, of the direct reports or attitudes of the direct reports, their confidence that the organization would achieve its strategic goals. And what you see here, again, those leaders who were very effective at champions change, those employees had more confidence that they would achieve the strategic goals than those who are low on champions change. So there's some really significant effects from this one competency. Yeah. So let me just summarize. Uh, we've seen that the ability to lead change is truly a, a key skill for leaders to have. The, the, simply put, great leaders make change happen. Secondly, that those people who report to leaders who are skilled in leading change have much greater confidence in the 
organization's ability to be successful. And third, that those direct reports also have higher engagement levels of their own. So it, it is clear that this, this capability is one that has a very strong impact on a leader's impact on uh, you know the, his his or her subordinates and their overall success. Uh, it's it's really critical, Jay. Okay, those of you who are familiar at all with our work know that one of the things that uh, we've been able to do is to take any capability like leading change and looking inside of our database have been able to identify, so are there other behaviors that seem to go hand in hand with this one? And when we've identified those that are highly correlated, uh, we've labeled them strength builders. These are, these are sets of behaviors. These are practices that really strengthen the, the leader's ability to bring about effectively change within their organization. So in the case of this topic, leading change, we found that there were indeed five such strength builders. The first is one called fosters innovation. And by that we mean it's the extent to which a leader is personally innovative and encourages other people around him or her to introduce innovative approaches into the change process. So it's that willing to kind of get out of the rut, get out of the box, try new things and be innovative. That was the first one. And you know, you, you would guess that uh, it's sort of a requirement, right? If you yeah. resist innovation, <laughs> you, you resist change and, and embracing it, it it's, it's really critical. The second is to act quickly. Uh, Jack and I, uh, several years ago, wrote a book called Leadership Speed. And what we found is that leaders who move quickly are much more effective. Now, I always kind of turn to the analogy of, of, of when you have a Band-Aid and you're struggling with taking it off, do I do it slowly or fast? And <laughs> my, my, you know, I mean, my kids, they would always, you know, they would be slow and it's just more painful. It is so much better to do it quickly. And, and the same thing happens with change. Uh, you know, if you think about, you know, kind of dragging it out and, and people get frustrated with change, boy, if you can increase the speed, it makes it it, it makes it much more effective and you end up being much more effective by moving quickly. And this is a key competency that helps. The third uh, strength builder was is one that we've labeled strategic perspective. And as it says here, it this describes the extent to which a leader makes the link between the needed change and what the organization's avowed strategy is. You know, it, it really helps when you're introducing any change, if the leader can be very clear about, so how does this new product, how does this new process, how does this change in our, in our, our working pattern, how does that really impact the broader strategic initiative and direction of the organization? And so, we, we found that this ability to kind of link change to the strategy is really the an important strength builder. Another one that's very critical is this external perspective, uh, you know, where you start to look at the big picture and what's happening outside the organization. I don't know if you've, uh, most people have climbed a mountain and, and what's interesting about climbing a mountain is if you stand at the base of the mountain and you look up, you you think you can see the top of the mountain. <laughs> you know, you go, well, that's right there. But if you hike up, what you're really seeing is a ridge <laughs> that sticks out. 
-hmm. And once you get there, you say, you go, oh my gosh, there's more mountain up there. And that's a funny thing about, uh, you know, change is, is that oftentimes you, you think you see the top, but you don't, there's more to it. And so having that perspective of, of looking, you know, backing up and looking at the whole perspective. And it's just fascinating to me how much we get so caught up in the internal workings of our business, what's going on with our business, what we're experiencing, but we're not looking out at what our customers are experiencing. We're not seeing what our competitors are doing. This is a critical piece of change and helping people understand that broader perspective of what's really happening out there. Who else is doing something? What are the needs that are changing? If you don't have that, it makes it more difficult to change. And the fifth strength builder that uh, our research identified is the one that I alluded to earlier, which is the inspires and motivates. Now, this basically describes the extent to which a leader generates excitement and enthusiasm about the change that's being proposed. Uh, and there seems to be you know, nothing that can equal just the, the personal uh, communication of passion and, and the ability of the, of the leader to help other people uh, catch some of that, uh, you know, that, that enthusiasm for, for what this change is going to bring. And because change means overcoming inertia, uh, th this quality of being inspiring and motivating is really a very important one. Okay, so those are the five strength builders. Now we kind of talk about what's the impact of those. And so Joe kind of described that for us. Well, we, we, we sort of said, gee, what would happen if you looked at all five and you said, well, I, I need to be good at all of them. And so if you're not good at any of them, if you're not above average on any of them, your, your ability to champions change would be at the 27th percentile. So if you were above average on one, it takes it up a, a bit. It, it almost doubles at 47th percentile. And if two, it was 56th percentile, three, it's 62nd percentile, four, it's the seven, 67th percentile. So a lot of people approach this and saying, well, I've got to be good at all those and, and let me, I'll work, you know, trying to be pretty good at everything. And in our view, that's the wrong approach. Look what happens if you're really good at just one of those strength builders, if it's a profound strength. Your ability to champion change goes to the 72nd percentile. Just if you're good at really good at one, if you're really good at two, the 80th, three, 87th, and four, the 92nd. So as you see the impact of having these profound strengths, what we'd like you to think about is identify one of these that you could be great at, unless... <laughs> and this is the, the other thing about it. If one of those is a fatal flaw, that's really going to hurt you. So think about that. And, and as you think about that, I want you to think about your self-assessment. So the self-assessment really measures your preference for change. And the scores range from minus 10 to plus 10. Now, I will tell you that having a negative score on this, we have actually did a study where we matched up this self-assessment with 360 assessments. And those who scored in the negative end of this actually had a score that was below average on champions change. But if you were on the positive end, if you were plus six or higher, your ability to champions change was about the 67th percentile. So there's a correlation between your score here and the 360 scores that we find. We find that 
there's actually a strong correlation between your score on this and the 360. The correlation's 0.3, which is very good for a self-assessment. And so as you think about your score here, it sort of gives you your preference for change, your, your, your desire to do that, your interest in doing that. And so think about that. Uh, the average that, that we've calculated on this is about 2.86 uh, for about 3,000 people that we had in our database on this. Okay, so for today's webinar, Joe and I decided that we would try something a little new. A little new. Uh, we've we've often presented this research about behaviors that are highly correlated with some capability that you're wanting to change. So we thought, what about uh, using this as an example about how you could go about applying these strength builders to a common problem? So. I read a, a, a report recently from Josh Burson's organization uh, on leadership development. And Josh had done, we think, a very interesting study on, on this broader topic. Uh, his, his conclusions were somewhat surprising to him. And I'll just summarize a few of those conclusions. Uh, only 25% of the companies that they surveyed believed that leadership and leadership and development was truly delivering high value. Less than a fourth of the organizations were satisfied with their leadership team. And, and by the way, this involved the, the interviews of more, more than 50 uh, chief learning officers and surveys of, you know, of a couple of thousand organizations. Uh, the third conclusion that they came to was that uh, about 83% of the organizations that they surveyed had cut or, or kind of ne neglected their leadership development budgets in the pandemic and post-pandemic period. 40% uh, of the firms were spending less than $500 per employee per annum on their development. And finally, about 24% uh, believed that their leadership model was really up to date and and relevant to to the current period. So, given this interesting piece of research that was done by a kind of respected uh, firm, uh, we were thinking, you know, chances are most of the hearers, most of the people that will be attending today's webinar, might see this and say, yeah, we can identify with that. And, you know, that's something that we would like to change. And so we decided that we would kind of work with you and say, if this generally describes your organization, then how would you go about leading an effective change effort to make a dent in, in this situation, to make an improvement? And so what we thought we'd do is to kind of just sit back and think with you about, okay, how might we apply those strength builders in a way that would successfully bring about change? And we're hoping that you can see this apply to your own organization. So if your organization is generally described by that research that Josh, Josh Burson had done, we think that the place to begin may be to apply some strategic perspective. And one possibility would be that you would go out and collect data from your senior leadership team, just as Josh had interviewed 50 different uh, chief learning officers, that you would go talk to your leadership team and ask them the questions. Are, are you confident that we have a, an effective leadership team today? Are you confident in our in our leadership model? Uh, are you, as we look at our budgets, have we been in investing uh, a sufficient amount each year in developing our leaders? If indeed leadership development is the single most important thing we have as a leadership team to be responsible for, uh, what percentage of, of our leaders 
have an, in, an active individual development plan? Uh, and can we connect leadership development to our firm's strategy? Uh, chances are our firm has a, a strategy document that says this is where we want to be in three years or five years. And is leadership development a key part of that? So we would invite you to kind of think with us for a moment that maybe the first step is, can we bring strategic perspective to apply to this issue? The second one is, you know, the idea about acting quickly. As you saw on the, the slide that, that Joe reviewed, that uh, organizations or, and people that act quickly have a, you know, twice as great as great a, a likelihood of it succeeding. So as you think about, okay, can I bring a sense of urgency to this issue, to my organization? Can I convey to, to the people that I work with, my senior leadership team, uh, can I create a, a year long plan for developing our leaders using really proven methods of assessment and development? And can I say, hey, we should we should tackle this problem, and rather than putting it off for you know till till next year, uh, let's begin immediately doing something about it. The third thing you can do is to say, okay, and let me let me kind of put this in some perspective in terms of what are other organizations, our competitors. Uh, our frenemies, as somebody uh, labels them, what are they doing to, uh, to to improve their leadership effectiveness? And so, can I bring to this to this issue kind of an external perspective that compares us to the best? So, I would invite you to to think about okay, if we're going to tackle this broader problem that we all collectively face. Can we then apply these strength building behaviors, strategic perspective, acting quickly, external perspective, and then there's two more. We began by talking about fostering innovation. We would submit to you that, that the solution uh, to, to making this change is not just spending more money. Uh, it involves maybe creating specific work assignments that are truly developmental. And that involves the, our senior leadership team taking a, you know, a, a new perspective and being a little bit creative about how can we create opportunities whereby people could really grow. If in one of your discussions about a member of your uh, leadership team and your organization, someone said, well, you know, he really needs to be a, a more of a strategic thinker or she could really be more connected with our, with our clients. What, what work assignments could we give these two people that would allow them to develop in that dimension? Um, it, it really then sets the expectation within the organization that leaders, you know, that we take their development seriously and that we expect them to take their development much more seriously. And finally, if, can we apply this whole notion of in being inspiring and motivating? Um, organization change happens, <laughs> as my friend Tom Peters used to say, when there's a monomaniac with a mission, someone who really feels passionately about it and who focuses his or her attention on it, who conveys their own uh, passion, but also enlists other senior leaders in the organization who they know share this concern and who have passion for it. And how do you kind of coalesce this group to, to come together and bring about organizational change in your firm? Now, I think part of that being inspiring and motivating, it can be giving recognition to those who have a developmental mindset who are paying attention to the development of their people. Uh, you can you know, pr 
proposed that this topic be on every leadership team agenda and that no meeting goes without spending some time talking about how are we developing our people? And therefore you, you, you take time to recognize and celebrate success. So I, I've walked through these five with you uh, only as an exercise in saying, uh, we, want to, we want to have you see that these strength building behaviors truly can have a practical application for a specific organization change that you want to make. And so, so Joe, yeah. I guess we're going to ask this we, we We got a poll. And and I was just curious as you thought about those and, you know, kind of those five things. Uh, and we're going to give you some latitude here because you can choose up to three. <laughs> so, but which ones of those would, would you think would work best for you and your organization? Uh, which one of those, uh, you know, kind of would help you the most? Uh, we're curious. Uh, which ones do you, you think is going to come out on top here, Jack? I, I Well... <laughs> You said a lot about inspires there. <laughs> I said a lot about inspires. The, probably the one that's most most quantifiable and most maybe easily done is acting quickly. I mean, yeah. <laughs> to, to get going. Let's get uh, going. Do something. Um, but it, it will be interesting to see what people choose, especially when they've given when they've been given a chance to choose three. Well, uh, I was I was lucky. Sixty eight percent said uh, inspires, and yeah. actually sixty seven percent said strategic perspective. Uh, they all had votes. They all did. They all had votes. All above which, thirty. Which clearly says that they all kind of have the the uh, the quality of being able to buttress change efforts, and so. Yeah. We, we really strongly, we, well, th thank you for all weighing in and and see how these can really help in, in bringing about the kind of change that you want to see happen in your organization. One of the things that we invite you to do is, you know, reflect on your self-assessment and think about these uh, strength builders, uh, what you can do. Uh, the, the biggest problem we have uh, in, in improving our leadership effectiveness is people just scratch their head and don't know what to do. What the, uh, the strength builders provide for you is some really easy ways to think about how you can actually improve and what you can specifically do. And Jack, we've got a great little benefit for them, uh, for the people on the call here. Yeah, if you, uh, when you complete your exit survey, when you when you fill that in, which we obviously very much uh, wish you will do, then you can uh, you can download uh, this uh, little treatise that we've created on championing change and talking about the the five strength builders with some we think useful suggestions for how you can go about applying those. So please complete the exit survey and you will have the chance to uh, receive that development guide. So we have a couple of thoughts we'd like to leave with you. Um, a good friend of mine, uh, Daryl Connor, used to have a, an interesting kind of perspective about is, is your organization capable of absorbing the change that you're proposing? Uh, are, are, the, are the executives committed? Are, are the employees committed to it? And, and his favorite metaphor was, it's a little bit like a sponge. You know, if the sponge is completely full of water, you can throw it in a bucket and it isn't going to absorb any more water. Uh, so you need to kind of say, is the change that I'm proposing uh, one that this organization currently can can tackle? Can we can we take it on? Now, I think in most cases the answer is yes, but but it's a good question to ask. 
we know that there's a lot of evidence about how change is influenced by compelling stories. And so to the extent that you can create a compelling metaphor, a story that makes clear to everyone in your organization why the change that you're proposing is good for society, why it's good for your customers, why it's good for your firm, why it's good for your specific team, and why it's good for you personally, uh, then change is much more likely to happen. And finally, are can we be clear about what we specifically want people to do differently on Monday morning? I know I've gone personally to many kind of seminars and conferences and heard a lot of wonderful things. And, but as I've been finishing the day, I've said, okay, what am I going to do differently on Monday morning? Because the most important change almost always requires some new behavior on my part. So those are just some final thoughts that we'd like to leave with you on this topic today. Uh, and we will conclude by sharing with you a, a quotation from Amelia Earhart, who said, the most difficult thing is, is the decision to act. The rest is merely tenacity. The fears are paper tigers. You can do anything you decide to do. And we share that thought with you and wish you well as you lead change efforts in your firm. So, Brianne, give us our special offer. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much for all of those great thoughts. I learned a lot. Hopefully, my sponge was not full. Um, I thought of some new things. Uh, this skill is so critical for leaders. It's interesting that it's ranked down there, but I feel like in the last few years, so much change has been asked of leaders. We are, have been invited to reimagine, restructure the entire way that we work and that we function. And so this skill is quite critical right now. And leaders are on the front line. They are the ones who have to champion the changes and get everyone on board. So uh, something that we have for you that we think would be really valuable, especially in this first upcoming quarter, is this micro learning session that you got a, a little taste of today of, um, of, champ of championing change. You can see right there, you can have Dr. Joe Folkman come and host it. And we have it for 5,000 uh, for up to 25 participants, which is uh, saving the standard fee is 7,500. Um, but if this particular skill isn't one that you're looking for, we actually have an entire catalog of different micro learning sessions that we have developed over the past few years. You can see them right here. And this offer that we have can be available for one or two sessions. And if you're interested in any of these, you can let us know in the exit survey that will launch at the end of this webinar and let us know which ones you would be interested in. We'd love to speak with you more about this opportunity. And as always, we'd love your feedback on these webinars to know what type of topics you want to hear in the future. Uh, how did you like the research that was presented and any other tips or tricks or things that you appreciated, we'd love to hear about. So you can go to that link right there, um, that bit.ly link, or you can find it in the chat below. We're so glad that you came today. Thank you for participating and we'll see you next time.